Good morning. I'm Bonnie Raindrop, Project Director for the Pesticides and Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project. And on behalf of Maryland Pesticide Education Network, welcome to the 15th Annual Conference. If it's your first time to the conference, this project is unique. We bring together a group of diverse stakeholders who all share concerns about pesticide impacts on the bay and life around the bay, our people, pollinators, aquatic life, wildlife, and our environment as a whole. Now for 13 years, we met in person and most of us remember the phenomenal organic lunches we had at Pearlstone Conference Center and the conversations during lunch and the conference breaks. Well, today we're relying on technology. You can use the chat feature to share your thoughts, say hello to old friends and communicate with everyone. So please open your chat window with the button on the bottom of your screen and say hi. Tell us who you are and maybe what your connection to pesticides is. You'll also see a Q&A button and we'll use that tool to allow you to pose questions to our speakers. So open that up now as well. We'll get to as many questions as we can and what doesn't get answered live, we'll answer in writing and send it out after the conference with the links on Thursday. Next, I do wanna quickly thank our conference sponsors listed here they each play a really important role in our pesticide work in addition to helping to make this conference happen. Mom's Organic Market, Cottingham Farm, Fox Haven, KW Landscaping, and Maryland Clean Water Action are all partners in keeping our bay, our food supply, and our watershed healthy. And they each have a great story, so check them out. Next. Before I turn things over to our moderator, Dr. Greg Allen, let me tell you about Greg. For over 20 years, Greg's been a senior environmental scientist with EPA's Chesapeake Bay program, and he brings a wealth of expertise on toxic contaminants in the Bay. Luckily for us, Greg's been a guiding force in the pesticides and the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project since it began, and he facilitates the project's research working group. Greg? Thank you so much, Bonnie. Good morning, good morning, good morning, one and all. Welcome to our 15th annual Pesticides in Chesapeake Waters Conference. We started this around a picnic table uh, about 16 years ago at the Chesapeake Bay Program Office. And it's really been a pleasure to work on this project ever since. Uh, many thanks to the folks at the Maryland Pesticide Education Network for really taking the lead on developing a fabulous program for us. Uh, today, the way the day shapes up is uh, we're going to do a large group exercise to get your input on a couple of questions that we'd like to hear from you on. Uh, we know that we're going to have a just fantastic uh, assembly of people uh, in this conference with amazing uh, experience and knowledge, and we want to tap into that a bit. So we're going to have a couple questions for you to re respond to. Then we're going to hear a really interesting presentation by Nathan Donnelly. Um, we'll end by talking a bit about some priority projects happening in the toxic contaminant work group at the Chesapeake Bay program. And then we'll get a highlight on our next session together. So that's the way our, our session this morning shapes up. And before we jump into all of that, I just wanna take a couple minutes to mention here on our 15th uh, anniversary, a couple of the features of this project that have helped to sustain it and make it uh, so constructive and productive. And the first uh, is our working groups. So we have maintained these over time. And uh, this is where we go from talking and discussing and getting input to actually producing some work products. So four working groups, the first uh, research, we're looking at helping the other work groups understand among active ingredients that we know are used in the watershed and that we see when we do monitoring, which are the ones that we ought to be most concerned about. 
And that work group also identifies data gaps that hopefully the research community helps with. The agriculture working group educates farmers in the spirit of healthier farms and a healthier Chesapeake Bay. Healthy Alternatives Group uh, educates the public uh, and helps them understand some safer alternatives and safer choices. And the Smart on Pesticides Coalition Group works on policy and law with a focus mainly on Maryland uh, policy and law. So uh, these first three work groups, I'm um, just going to real quickly take a look at some of the work products that have come out of these groups. So I'm going to pause and let you uh, read over this list. And as far as some new work, uh, we are working on a new report that will be a summary of quite a few uh, research papers that either originated out of research done in the Chesapeake watershed or in a few cases outside the watershed, but we think still relevant. And we're gonna have a, a new report on some of this current research that we think is applicable in the Chesapeake watershed. So that's the research working group. Next, the ag agriculture working group. And I'll let you read this list. The ag working group is updating the farmer information kit. Our next work group is the Healthy Alternatives Work Group. I'll let you skim through this list. And a new area of focus for that working group is the saferdisinfectants.org website. And Bonnie's going to give us just a little bit of details around this website. Yes, we're very excited about this. Um, in our next meeting on November 30th, we'll be presenting a new website called Safer Disinfectants. And the project was developed by a working group member, Margie Roswell, and it's really nationally groundbreaking. We're really excited about the upcoming site and we can use your support in helping Google to know it's there. We're looking for volunteers simply to link to it from your websites and social media. So if you'd like to help, you can contact Margie in the chat. She's here with us today and uh, look forward to next week getting a, a full demo of how this amazing site works. Greg? All right, thank you, Bonnie. We look forward to that. So one more aspect of this project that I wanted to mention, in addition to our great working groups that uh, produce these useful products, uh, is some of the values that have sustained us. So I'm going to pause one more time here and let you read through this list. We have pulled together uh, every possible uh, stakeholder type, I think, on this topic over the years. Um, that is the beauty of it, is that we get so many different perspectives. And it's values such as these that allow us to maintain an environment that's safe for people to be open and sharing. And so uh, we will expect uh, that we will continue that and apply these values as we have discussions around this important topic. So one of the uh, benefits of the virtual format is that it, it has expanded our reach a little bit. Uh, we used to have to cap our registrants at about 100 and uh, that, that's not in place uh, now. So we had well over 150, I think approaching 200 
registrants for the conference. And again, that's one of the benefits of the virtual format. And that also means that we have amazing talent in the conference uh, today. So we'd like to tap into that a little bit and we'd like to hear from you and get your thoughts on a couple of questions. And these questions are gonna be uh, ones that the answers to them will help us with planning for the, for the, uh, the project in the coming year. Your input here will help us understand some high priorities that this project group might be able to make a contribution around. Uh, so we have two questions for you and we're gonna do this through a large group Jamboard activity. So um, if you've never used Jamboard before, it is a tool that's available on the Google platform and it's really wonderful for collaboration and getting input and getting lots of thoughts together quickly. Uh, it is a brainstorm sort of tool and so our fantastic producer, Doug, has uh, taken us over now to Jamboard. What's going to happen here in a few minutes is that there are going to be links that will appear in chat. So we're going to want to have access to chat. And you will, in uh, a minute or so, uh, see some links. When you click the link that's appropriate for the first letter of your last name, and we'll show you some more on that, you will go to this slide. Uh, this, uh, it will open a window in your browser and you'll go into the Jamboard. And to add a note to it, you come over to the left side as Doug is indicating here, and you can click on sticky note. Opens a sticky note and you type your thought when you're done and ready to post it to the Jamboard, you click save. So put it right there on the Jamboard. If for some reason you decided you didn't wanna post it, you'd use the cancel feature. And then once it's there, as Doug is showing, you can left click and drag it. There are also some other options with the three bullets like delete if you decide you wanna take it off. So that's how you add a sticky note to a Jamboard. And the other thing I wanna show you is how to navigate from one board to the other. Now, remember I mentioned there are two questions. So this is board one with question one and this uh, in the top center of the screen, you'll see that if we are on board one of three and there's a arrow on the right side that you click to move to board two where the second question is located. You wanna go back to board one, you go up and click on the left arrow and right back to board one. Now, there, these two questions, as you will see, are oriented to where are there opportunities? We wanna hear from you what you think the best opportunities are to reduce risk from pesticides in the first question. And if we click over to the second question, uh, it's what public education topics and management actions should this project promote in advance? Where are the opportunities with regard to education, management actions, uh, and also reducing risk from pesticides that you think are most important and we might all come together to work to make a contribution around. So that's what we're doing with our two questions and the way that we're gonna use Jamboard. The last Jamboard, there is one here, it is a third board that is just some basics around Jamboard. If you get a little stuck, you might look at this to see again how to, for example, post sticky notes to the Jamboard. Okay, so this is a big experiment that we're running here. Now, we needed to set up multiple Jamboards to accommodate the number of people that we were expecting today. So you'll see in the chat that the Jamboards are set up by first letter in last name. 
So we'd like you to choose the Jamboard that coincides first letter, last name. And that's because there's a limit of 50 people that can be working on an individual Jamboard. If by some chance you go to a board and it says it's full, then just uh, close that window and pick one of the other links that is in the chat. Okay, so we're gonna provide about 10 minutes of quiet time for this. Please go ahead and click the link in chat that corresponds to first letter and your last name and give us your awesome insights on those two questions. And we'll be back in this main room and back to our meeting in about 10 minutes.
All right, we're about halfway through your time with the Jamboard. Two more minutes. One more minute, we're wrapping it up. Welcome back 
everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your participation there. I was visiting several of the jam boards and from first look, uh, we were very successful with this. I see lots of sticky notes, uh, a lot related to education and awareness building is perfect kind of input uh, for this project. So I think uh, we can say that we were really successful there and there is so much good information. Now, let me say a little more about what we're gonna do with your input. Uh, we have a couple of folks that were assigned as moderators, one for each of the questions that were on the jam boards. Uh, we have Ling Tan with the Sierra Club and Veronica Corella from Maryland Children's Environmental Health Coalition, who are going to be looking at the jam boards we just created. And today will report back to us with just a few top level themes or intriguing points and questions that they see on the jam boards. We'll get just a little bit of insight to uh, what you all provided today. And then at our next session, we will bring back a much more complete analysis of what we heard from you on the jam boards. So uh, we'll hear from Ling and Veronica a little later this morning. Uh, our next item though uh, is a presentation. So let's go ahead and transition to that. Uh, we're gonna hear this morning from Nathan Donnelly. Nathan Donnelly is the Environmental Health Science Director at the Center for Biological Diversity, where his work focuses on pesticide policy and regulation in the USA. His work involves studying issues surrounding the increasing exposure of both people and wildlife to toxins, providing scientific expertise and public education on those issues. Before joining the center, he worked as a scientific researcher in the Oregon Center for Research on Occupational and Environmental Toxicology, studying the links uh, between exposure to environmental toxicants and cancer. Nathan holds a doctoral degree in cell and developmental biology. So we'll hand it over to Nathan. Nathan? Uh, wonderful. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Nathan Donnelly. Um, so glyphosate uh, has been around for 50 or so years, um, but it wasn't until uh, the, around the 1990s that it really came into what it is now, which is the most widely used pesticide in the United States and the world as well. Um, you can see um, around the early to late 90s, um, you see a huge increase in the amount of glyphosate used per year, and it's topped out at about 300 million pounds used per year. Most of that increase was in corn and soy, and glyphosate's uh, increase really coincided with uh, the advent of genetic engineering and the use of herbicide-tolerant traits in many commodity crops like corn, soy, and cotton so that those crops could be sprayed with glyphosate and glyphosate wouldn't kill them. So before genetic engineering, you really had only two windows you could use your herbicide, either before you planted your crop or after you harvested. And now with genetic engineering um, and having herbicide tolerant traits introduced into your crops, you can spray glyphosate throughout the entire growing season, even in the late spring and summer months, which were usually off limits for herbicide use. So this resulted in just an enormous explosion in use in glyphosate. Um, that's mainly driven by corn and soy, but really all of these crops, cotton, alfalfa, you name it, uh, glyphosate became the herbicide of choice. And just to give you some perspective here, uh, this blue arrow is at about 70 million pounds a year. And that's the second most widely used pesticide in the US, which is atrazine. So glyphosate is in an absolute league of its own um, by a factor of at least four. Um, and, you know, 
there were people raising alarms about this uh, certainly before, but it wasn't until 2015 that the World Health Organization uh, really uh, came out and identified glyphosate uh, to be a probable carcinogen that people started really taking a very uh, critical look at this. Um, it's hard to, to imagine, but, but before this, you know, glyphosate was really thought of as completely benign. And there was so much misinformation flowing. People, you know, were saying that it was safer to drink Roundup out of a bottle than, um, uh, than sprinkle some salt on your dinner plates. Um, and of course, that is just outrageous. Um, but that was really the prevailing view that glyphosate was completely benign. Um, glyphosate, of course, is the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup. Um, and now Bayer, who purchased Monsanto and all the baggage that came with that, is uh, really drowning in, in class action litigation. And um, recently they've decided to stop selling glyphosate and Roundup in the residential sector in the next few years, which just a few years ago would have been totally unthinkable. Um, but they're facing so many liabilities with uh, harms from this product that they're gonna stop selling it to residential consumers. It'll still be, of course, offered to the agricultural sector. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about glyphosate resistance today. Um, that can mean a few things. One is you know, genetic engineering in corn and soy caused those uh, crops to become glyphosate resistant. Uh, that is one way to develop glyphosate resistance is through genetic engineering. But I'm gonna be talking today about glyphosate resistance in weeds, uh, which is not something you wanna see because the glyphosate is targeting those weeds. Um, and this doesn't happen through genetic engineering. Obviously it happens through natural selection and just evolution in action. Um, so after you spray these weeds uh, in this field year after year after year with glyphosate, you'll see that uh, you know, the individual that acquired natural resistance to glyphosate is now being selected for and really uh, overcoming that entire field. And this is what that looks like. So this is a row crop field um, and you can see there, you know, a lot of bare patches. So this has been sprayed with herbicide, um, but you can see this, I believe it's Italian ryegrass. Uh, it's just completely untouched by the herbicide that was sprayed in this field. And it's really starting to take over. Um, and glyphosate resistant weeds are now an enormous problem and found on more than hundred million acres of farmland in the US. And it's right now encompassed probably up to 20 species now and uh, it's present in just about every state in the US that has a sizable amount of agriculture. So this is a big deal. Um, and it's leading um, to something called the pesticide treadmill. And um, uh, the pesticide treadmill of yore uh, was, was quite a bit different. So this term was coined in the 1970s and was really developed as a way to identify this phenomenon that was happening where pesticides were stopped, stopped working against a certain species and then they became ineffective and you tossed them out. And then you add another one in that works until it stops working, then you toss it out. So it's this very replace, replace, replace uh, type treadmill. Um, but that's not happening anymore. Glyphosate, uh, while it has lost efficacy against some weeds, uh, it's still very effective against many other weeds. So now people aren't ditching glyphosate they're just combining uh, um, different herbicides on top of it. So instead of this longitudinal approach um, by replacing herbicides, we're now doing this sort of vertical approach where you're combining, 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 combining and stacking those traits. It's more like a pesticide treadmill, I guess, um, to beat uh, uh, an analogy or a, an, an analogy to death. Um, uh, but, so, so this is, this is the, um, the recommended approach to combat uh, resistance is to combine pesticides. And it's been shown that combining multiple pesticides can actually delay resistance to some extent. And so the combining uh, is being driven in large part through uh, genetic engineering, the same thing that gave rise to glyphosate and really facilitated glyphosate resistance in weeds. Um, and in the spirit of Halloween, uh, I'll dub this one, the only corn worse than candy corn, um, this Monsanto uh, corn variety that's resistant to five different herbicides. 
uh, is currently under consideration for deregulation by the USDA. And I made this table a while ago, so it's woefully out of date, but you can see that uh, many of these uh, commodity crops here have herbicide resistant traits that have been deregulated. So they are able to be commercialized. Um, and you can see that resistance is not only to single herbicides, but also entire classes. Um, and the trend now in the, in the industry is to stack these traits so that you have a corn or soy or a cotton that is resistant to multiple herbicides. So whereas you, you know, 20 years ago, you could only apply glyphosate in the summer months. Now you can apply many, many, many more. And so that's leading to an overall increase in herbicide use. Um, these are the most widely used herbicides in the United States. Um, in these graphs, you can see on the y-axis here, you have total use and then, uh, on the x-axis, you've got year from 1992 to 2018. Um, and here's glyphosate again. You can see this meteoric rise in the late 90s and early 2000s. But then it's, it's sort of leveled off here. Um, that's a few, a few reasons for that. One is that it, it sort of reached market penetration around this time. And the other is that it's losing efficacy. So people aren't still using more glyphosate. But notice that its use is not decreasing. So we're using the exact same amount of glyphosate year after year, 300 million pounds, 300 million pounds. And then now um, we are using more and more other herbicides. So you can see right around the time that glyphosate plateaued, there's been an increase in all of these other herbicides, um, even Paraquat, which I would consider to be one of the most toxic pesticides in use anywhere in the world. Um, is increasing dramatically, almost threefold in the last 15 years or so. Um, total chlorophomosafin. Um, so you can see that while use of glyphosate is standing still, everything else is increasing. And I put atrazine on here. Obviously, its use isn't increasing, thankfully. Um, <clears throat> but its use has been so steady for the last 25, 30 years. And really, the selling point of genetically engineering crops to be resistant to glyphosate, so-called Roundup Ready crops, was that everyone knew glyphosate use was going to increase, but we were all told that use of other herbicides was going to decrease. And you can see at the time glyphosate was increasing, everything is either standing still, um, maybe a slight dip in dicamba, maybe a slight dip in fomosafin, but everything's either staying still or increasing during this time, even atrazine, which was supposed to be replaced, at least in corn, by glyphosate. So uh, the benefits of herbicide tolerant genetically engineering were um, vastly oversold. And now we're dealing with the consequences of that, which is uh, increasing herbicide use across the board. Um, so unfortunately, I couldn't find any Maryland specific data. Um, there's just not enough agriculture in Maryland to really be on USDA's radar. Um, and it, it doesn't conduct pesticide use surveys um, in this state. So. Um, I'm just going to show you national trends, and my assumption is that Maryland is following those national trends, but I'm not 100% certain about that. So these are the three most widely grown crops in Maryland, soybeans, corn, and wheat. Um, and you can see, again, on, on the Y, you've got uh, total use and then increasing years on the x-axis. You can see that herbicide use, and this is total herbicide use. So in the previous slide, I showed you a few examples. This is total herbicide use in these three crops. And it's just been you know, on a steady increase uh, since the early 2000s at least um, for all three of these crops. And the slope here, just to give you some perspective, is about 7 million pounds per year. So however much herbicide we use in soybeans this year, it'll be another 7 million next year, another 14 million the year after that, 21 million a year after that. So it just keeps combining and combining and it's increasing the total herbicide load in the environment that is affecting uh, different ecosystems like the, the Chesapeake Bay. Um, you know, wheat is a little bit of a different example. It's not, you know, this sort of straight up shot like it is in, in corn and soy. And, you know, wheat looks like it had a huge increase in the early 2000s and then it's plateaued off uh, since then. So this increase was likely due to use of Glyphosate as a desiccant, uh, it's common for farmers to spray glyphosate on their crop before harvest because it facilitates harvesting. And that became uh, popular to do in the 2000s. So um, use of as a desiccant sort of led to this initial increase. 
but thankfully there's not a genetically engineered component to wheat. Uh, US consumers are very wary of eating genetically engineered foods. And so other than a few niche things like apples that don't brown and potatoes that have less acrylamide, most of the genetic engineering that's happening has been in crops that aren't very widely eaten by uh, people, especially Americans like soybeans and corn. These are mostly used to feed animals and corn is used uh, for ethanol and then things like cotton and alfalfa. That's where a lot of the herbicide tolerant traits um, are. So thankfully wheat doesn't have a genetically engineered component that's been commercialized yet. So they have not become accustomed to using herbicides during the late spring and summer months. And therefore you're not seeing this um, enormous increase in herbicide use that we are in, in corn and soy and things like cotton and alfalfa. So that's a good thing. Um, you know, there is really a, a figurative fork in the road in, um, in the 2010s um, where it was really clear that Roundup Ready uh, herbicide tolerant crops were not working that well. And, uh, you know, a lot of broken promises there and uh, the consequences we were already starting to deal with in the 2010s. And we had the option to say, okay, this was a failed experiment, let's move on. Um, but the pesticide industry was really forceful to sort of um, increase the herbicide tolerant traits and combine them. Um, and this is the path we're on right now uh, is to basically combine herbicide tolerant traits until we're out of herbicide tolerant traits and then tough luck. Um, it's a short term fix strategy. Um, you know, it's an easier path initially, but, uh, you know, it's going to lead to a whole lot of suffering and I'll get into that um, in my last slide. But two trends are starting to emerge on this path we're on. One is that older herbicides are being repurposed and rebranded as these shiny new things. And the other is that new herbicides are being approved and I'll go into the consequences of that in a few slides. So here are the new uh, the old pesticides, the oldie moldy pesticides that are being repurposed as these sort of shiny new things. Um, the first one is atrazine and the triazine. So the good news here is we're probably not going to see an increase in use of these in agriculture, um, at least in the near term. And that's a very good thing. Another bit of good news is that many non-agricultural uses of atrazine um, have been canceled. Uh, this is due to the EPA starting to comply with its duties under the Endangered Species Act, whereby um, it analyzed all of the triazines, atrazine, simazine, and propazine, um, and how they can affect endangered species. And during this process, the pesticide companies that sell atrazine and simazine um, have voluntarily canceled a lot of non-agricultural uses. These are things like uh, use on roadsides and use in conservation reserve programs and um, use in forestry and on Christmas tree farms. So um, you can thank the Endangered Species Act, many non-ag uses of atrazine are gonna be canceled and hopefully that will translate into less of this pesticide being found uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. The bad news is um, it probably won't decrease in ag. If there's one certainty in life, it's that a lot of atrazine is gonna be used on cornfields. Um, and that's something we're gonna to have to deal with uh, for quite a while because um, EPA had an opportunity um, in its re-registration process with atrazine that happened recently. Um, and unfortunately, um, in my opinion, I don't think we came out with many common sense mitigations that will really start to decrease how much we see of this being used in agriculture. And the shiny new thing for atrazine is a product called Acuron, which combines atrazine and mesotrione and metolachlor and bicyclopyrone in one handy dandy package that you can um, spray on your crops. Another one is 2,4-D. So the shiny new thing here is Enlist Duo. This is a product that combines 2,4-D with glyphosate to be used on Enlist crops, which are resistant to 2,4-D glyphosate and glufosinate. Thankfully, the 2,4-D salt form of uh, salt form being used in Enlist Duo is the choline form, um, which is probably less likely to be a water contaminant than the ester form, which is a widespread water contaminant. Uh, the bad news is 2,4-D is really incredibly toxic to aquatic organisms, probably on the level of atrazine. Um, and its presence is likely gonna be found um, in the bay more often 
in coming years. Um, dicamba, uh, there's not really any silver lining to this, unless you've been living under a rock for the last five or six years. Uh, you'll know that dicamba is widely implicated in harm to not only crops, but natural environments. Um, this is all terrestrial harm being perpetrated by the volatility of this pesticide and its uh, drift as well, uh, harming nearby ecosystems. And its use is increasing dramatically. And I actually think dicamba is going to turn out to be more of a water contaminant than we give it credit for right now. Um, some of the field studies we've been reviewing um, really makes me a little worried about runoff. So um, hopefully I'm not right about that, but I'm definitely worried about how um, steeply dicamba use is increasing. And Paraquat, uh, there's really no PR firm in the world that can window dress this monster. So there's really no shiny new thing. And there's also no silver lining here. Paraquat is banned in the European Union. It's banned in China, it's banned in Brazil, it's banned in much of the world. And yet we're using more and more and more of it each year. It's so toxic that a sip of Paraquat is enough to kill a full grown adult and there's no antidote. Bad news is its use is increasing dramatically in soy. I'm sure that's the case in Maryland as well. So those are the old pesticides that are being repurposed. Now we've got um, some newer herbicides in the pipe, uh, many of which have already been approved um, and they're fluorinated. Um, fluorinated pesticides really accounted only for a very small minority of pesticides by the year 2000. Um, however, in the last five or six or seven years, they account for the vast majority of pesticides being approved. So this is, this is what passes for innovation uh, in the herbicide world is basically taking old herbicides and saying, what if we replace this chlorine with a fluorine um, and starting to fluorinate everything? Um, you know, these pesticides range from slightly to very persistent. Um, and as you know, the carbon fluorine bonds are incredibly strong and don't break down. So the pesticides that break down relatively quickly are going to break down into degradates that are going to exist, you know, indefinitely, potentially. So whatever we put into our environment of these new herbicides and pesticides, it's not just herbicides that are being fluorinated, it's everything, um, are, is going to persist. <laughs> you know, we're basically back to where we were in the 70s with organochlorines and their incredibly long persistence, um, which is really difficult to see. This is just a few examples of new herbicides that have been approved just in the last few years and the number of carbon fluorine bonds they have. The good news is if there's a silver lining here is that they tend to be a little more lipophilic and maybe less likely to be water contaminants. Although as we know with, you know, PFAS and all fluorinated things, the more you use them, they're just gonna end up in water. That's, that's where they're gonna go. And they're, they're likely to be quite a bit less toxic than the atrazines and the 2,4-Ds and the paraquats. Um, although, you know, these new herbicides, all we have right now are essentially a couple dozen toxicity studies submitted by the pesticide companies that sell the herbicides. So there's a lot of unknowns about the true toxicity of these. And I think in the next decade or so, when independent researchers start studying them more, uh, we'll have a better sense of that. So. How will this affect the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I did. You know, or what we know is that herbicide use is increasing without a doubt. But we're in a major state of flux right now. Things are still going up, 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 up. And the plateau, the ceiling is, I, I, I think it's still very far away, more than a couple of years away. So how much of these things we're going to be finding in the Chesapeake Bay water um, it's going to depend on where that ceiling is, um, and we're, we're not quite sure where that is yet. Um, mixtures, 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 as it has been for the last few decades, um, expect to be finding more complex mixtures in the bay. That's just what happens when you increase the amount uh, and the number of pesticides you're using. Um, and, you know, with complex mixtures, you know, there's not enough study in the world uh, to tell you whether these are safe, just because the sheer permutations of the different numbers of components and the different concentrations of those components is just staggering. And so there's always gonna be this inherent uncertainty with mixtures and that can be really frustrating for a lot of people. And the regulatory system is not set up to deal with this. As herbicides stop working, expect more tilling, which will lead to sediment loading in the Bay. I'm not saying 
herbicides are better than tilling. Um, they certainly aren't. They both have bad parts to them. Um, but as, as you use fewer herbicides, you're probably going to get more tilling and that might lead to more erosion. Um, so I'll just end with, um, there's going to be weeds that can't be killed by any chemical herbicide in our lifetime. Uh, this is widely acknowledged and um, this is going to lead to a lot of um, a lot of desperation by many people and desperation never leads to anything good. So we can start transitioning now um, to sort of get away from this chemical herbicide approach to farming uh, and make it easier um, or we can do it the hard way, which is just pretend that nothing is wrong until um, you know, we're forced to make extremely tough decisions. So uh, with that, um, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Nathan, for those perspectives. Uh, th this topic of glyphosate resistant weeds is really uh, important and fits well with the uh, project uh, because we need to have some awareness of what active ingredients are being used so that we can have smarter uh, monitoring programs and uh, do some better risk assessment. Uh, so this is one of the topics that we think uh, this conference and this project can help uh, the community stay abreast of. So really appreciate you bringing this current information. Um, so if we could, we've got a few questions for you, Nathan. Is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Uh, so here's one. Uh, many park and public land and the agencies that manage them use glyphosate as the go-to herbicide uh, any thoughts on how public land managing agencies can deal with super weeds and other resistant uh, weeds and exotic plants in their parks and wildlife refuges um, where there's probably already the use of glyphosate for many of those controls? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, you know, pesticide use is always a cost benefit analysis and it always should be. Um, and when you have some of those uses uh, dealing with invasives, um, you know, depending on the situation, sometimes there could be an environmental benefit there to using herbicides, um, sometimes not. So, you know, I think uh, it's going to really have to depend on the specific situation, what sort of, um, um, you know, goals you have and, you know, the potential for success. Sometimes, you know, as many of you know, a lot of really invasive weeds are really untouched by most chemical herbicides. You know, they either don't absorb it very well um, or it's really hard to get really good control with an herbicide only approach. So, um, you know, different, you know, trying to use different mechanisms to, to get at that is probably one good thing. Um, but if herbicides are, are being identified as, as the necessary approach, then um, yeah, you know, those decisions all, although as, as tough as they may be really, you know, need to be made. Yeah, oh, I agree. And taking a bit of an integrated pest, pest management approach uh, in those uh, public land management challenges using chemicals when we have to, and we've exhausted other less risky approaches. Okay, um, uh, here's one. Um, we talked a bit about synergistic effects when there's multiple pesticides present, particularly in our surface waters. And are you aware of anything happening, any research um, in academia or elsewhere in the European Union, even on synergistic effects and combinations and how to tackle that challenge? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's an enormous challenge. Uh, I think there are, it, it's on more researchers radar now than it was even five years ago. So I think people are, are acknowledging that no one, nothing ever is just exposed to one pesticide anymore. Um, you're exposed to 
generally mixtures of pesticides as well as mixtures of other pollutants that just exist out in our environment. So um, with that acknowledgement, I think comes more uh, realistic research where you're exposing, you know, various taxa of animals um, to uh, to different, you know, mixtures um, and seeing what what those types of effects are. Um, in terms of synergy, so synergy is, is refers to added or sorry uh, interactive effects. So um, two chemicals sort of uh, act to to harm, you know, the environmental receptor or the person uh, in a much greater way than you would expect. Just how the two act on their own. Um, the European Union is starting. It's in the very beginning stages of starting to um, tackle this problem. Um, and I don't know where that'll end up because it's incredibly difficult. If you can imagine just the sheer permutations of mixtures that people or animals could be exposed to on the environment, it's astronomical. Um, and there's not enough money in the world to do all the research necessary to answer those questions. So, you know, uh, I, I'm hoping that, that the US in coming years will really um, start to at least try to identify a framework that it can be, um, you know, useful in, in trying to um, tackle this problem because right now we're not really doing a whole lot. Um, and I think it's leading to a lot of underestimation of risk in our risk assessments. Okay, well, maybe we can keep an eye on that work in the EU and bring that back to our community here and keep up on that. Um, it is a really difficult challenge and it also includes degradants. It's not only uh, the parent compounds that are uh, occurring, um, it's the degradates and that mixture and how to judge risk around those mixtures is, is a great big challenge. Okay, here's one more question. Uh, one of the alternatives to glyphosate that's being used is glufosinate. Uh, at least that's our understanding. Um, have you heard much about glufosinate? Is it similar in structure to glyphosate and similar risk, or is it a different active ingredient altogether? It is a different active ingredient, um, and it's you know one of the many herbicides I couldn't find room <laughs> to put on my slide um, that's use is increasing really quite a bit, probably at the level that dicamba is. Um, and it's almost all that, that increase of use in glufosinate is happening in soybeans. Um, so Liberty League soybeans are the genetically engineered uh, glufosinate resistant trait um, that sort of took over for Roundup Ready crops um, in many parts of the US. So glufosinate is increasing. It is very sim uh, structurally similar to glyphosate. Um, and I would, I, I sort of think of them as very similar in terms of their toxicities. Um, which is to say, you know, sort of on the moderate end of the toxicity spectrum, um, and it's it's you know it's sad that I'm I'm um, describing a glyphosate, a, a probable carcinogen, as as moderate toxicity, um, and that's certainly no um, endorsement of it, but uh, more of a, an indictment on just how really bad some of these other alternatives are, the 2,4-Ds, uh, atrazines, paraquats. Um, that's really where, where my focus is on, on toxicity. And so while I'd, I'd love to see glyphosate and glufosinate come down a lot, um, um, thankfully they don't have the toxicity spectrum that some of these other more worrisome ones do. Hmm. Okay. Hey, I'm gonna quick uh, bust in here, just doing a quick time check. Oh yeah, sure, Emily. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, okay, Nathan, well, we could go on all day, I'm sure, uh, really great information. The uh, Q&A feature here in Zoom webinar allows us to answer questions um, by typing an answer. So uh, we really uh, hope, Nathan, that you can, to the extent you're available, uh, type some answers to the additional questions that were put into the Q&A feature. And then there's also a few more in chat. If you had time to scan through those and maybe uh, throw a few thoughts back to the folks who had asked those questions, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. So, okay. Thank you very much for participating today. And um, that is some very interesting information about 
different active ingredients that may be used differently now that there is glyphosate resistance. So very relevant to our work. Okay, so let's um, touch base now again with our jam boards. Uh, so our two moderators, Ling Tan and Veronica Corella, have been looking at the boards and we're just going to have them provide to us a couple of themes, uh, maybe a couple of uh, comments or questions that looked particularly constructive and interesting. And they're just going to give us a little insight to what was on the boards. So I'll hand it over first to Ling Tan for question number one. Hi, everyone. Hey, Ling. All right, so I'm glad to be on board. Um, thanks um, for having me as um, moderating this part. Um, there was a great set of um, jam boards. There was great comments, and I'm sorry I can't like touch on all of them, um, but I was able to um, see a couple of themes. Um, one of the theme is um, about public use of pesticides and also the, the county use of pesticides. So that was one theme which included, um, which include a lot of it included um, education. Um, so I think Veronica will be covering education parts. So I won't go too much into the education parts. But um, one of the themes under that was policy making, uh, which included reducing the the sales of the most commonly used pesticides um, and, tr and increasing transparency at the local level. Um, so that could mean in increasing transparency of the county use of pesticides um, or, um, um, right. And so uh, one of the th themes there was working with the local governments, either working with the county executive's office to uh, increase education um, to to the uh, public, um, or 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 educating the lawmakers themselves, um, so that so I guess I put all that under policy and and working with the government. Um, another um, theme that we had was um, uh, reaching out to the farming community, um, whether supporting those that are organic or helping farmers transition, um, giving them the resources and tools for transitioning. Um, so that's what I have there. Um, one of the interesting ideas that I did see from the Jamboard was um, uh, the idea of um, using plantings, uh, encouraging the public to plant natives and, and for pollinators as a bridge to, um, to, to get uh, the education part out. So um, that, that was a very interesting thing there. Um, and um, let me see. And, and another one was uh, along the, the idea of policy was working with the ag department to put out um, educational videos for the, both the public and, and for farmers. So that's what I have. Okay, thank you very much, Ling. Uh, it sounds like some very interesting thoughts around education and policy there. Uh, so thank you for that quick insight. Let's go over now to question two, Veronica. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Okay, so this was um, what public education topics and management actions can the project promote and advance? And we had a lot of wonderful responses and the theme seemed to be that we need to do a better job of educating the consumers and public officials and agencies on the exact impact of pesticides and what the alternatives are. So we had some really good um, points here and I'd just like to just reference a few of them. Um, the, first, the one that I thought was most interesting was to create um, a saferpesticides.org website as a partner um, to the saferdisinfectants.org uh, website. Um, and I, I suppose that would be something specific to pesticides that are allowed for use in the state of Maryland, because currently we have like 14,000 pesticides uh, registered. Um, another point here that we have here is to increase the awareness 
of non-toxic ways to deal with pest issues, educate consumers and farmers on the health risk of specific pesticides in use. Um, and then um, they uh, comment that MPN is already um, has some mosquito outreach um, and education programs, which is excellent. Um, it would also, um, we should also do something to reach out to homeowners who daily use multiple chemicals in their yards and homes and not realizing what harm they're doing to themselves and their water and their food sources and the bay. So the theme really seemed to be education is needed on what products are safer to use on residential properties, um, in communities, along rights of way, um, and um, just educate so that us, um, smarter choices can be made. And specific information, there was one in group T through Z that said turf grass management in HOAs and training landscapers in organic uh, practices is needed because we've done a lot with farmers, but I think uh, it, the theme seemed to come out. We need to um, address um, commercial um, applicators and commercial landscapers. And also the final point uh, that or theme was that mosquito spraying um, uh, that we need to identify and educate people on the alternatives because of the harmful effects on humans, health and wildlife. And I could read some more. There were some really wonderful points made. All of them are useful, um, but that seems to be the theme and, and the main highlights. Okay, thank you, Veronica. Wow, yeah, a lot there. I love the, the ideas that had to do with building on previous work or uh, uh, using previous work as an example or a framework for something else that could be done. So uh, that's always nice to leverage previous work that way. So, okay, great ideas. Now, let me just say again that what we're gonna do is take all of the notes that were added to the boards and we'll do some affinity analysis and group the like thoughts together and uh, at our next session, we'll show you the results of that. And the purpose is to find some of the uh, ideas that you provided and some of these possible directions and send them over to our work groups and let that information be used and considered as the work groups uh, think about future work. And as an added Plus to this, if some of you were compelled by some of these ideas and wanted to join in and participate and work in our work groups, that is really a great outcome. Um, it's, it's pretty neat the way we have produced things that really got used and got a lot of visibility. And if you'd like to be part of that, we have an open door and welcome your participation. So uh, that's what we're gonna do with this Jamboard work and we'll hear more about it at our next session. Thank you very much again, Ling and Veronica for doing a quick look and giving us uh, a preview of that. All right, let's keep moving through our agenda. Uh, as we wrap up here today, uh, I'm gonna, just offer a few updates on some things that are happening in the toxic contaminant work group. Uh, this is the group at the Chesapeake Bay program that includes uh, pollutants such as PCBs and mercury that are the leading causes for fish consumption advisory in the watershed, but lots of other contaminants that we have some concern around due to some form of, of an effect on living resources or humans in the watershed. So I'm just gonna give you an update on a few very recent activities. Uh, these first two, I'm just gonna give some verbal comments on. Uh, there is right now a look at the monitoring networks uh, that the Chesapeake Bay program funds and uses to keep our eyes on the health and well being of the bay and its watershed. And as part of that, we're talking about how some of the networks could be in better service of toxic contaminant monitoring. 
I will say that our focus on this is currently around PCBs and our highest priority in the work group is PCBs. That was an agreement that was made among the partners. And uh, it's mostly because in, in the estuary in particular, uh, it is the, the pollutant that drives most of the fish consumption advisories. It's the pollutant that triggers the most impairments in the, in the watershed. And so uh, we have the dual benefit here of helping the environment and contributing to better human health when we reduce the amount of PCBs that end up in our fish. So that is our prime um, uh, focus, but we uh, work on other things as well, including pesticides. The phase seven watershed model is starting to be designed now. So the watershed model is the model that we use to process inputs that we get from the jurisdictions in the watershed. Those inputs are about the best management practices that they have on the ground. And we combine that with hydrology and land use data and lots of data sets to create a model that is predictive of where we're headed with regard to dissolved oxygen in particular in the Bay. And that's really uh, always had a primary focus on nutrients and sediment. As we start into phase seven watershed model design, we're asking questions about what other ecosystem services, or in our case, pollutants, other pollutants that we can model and do some scenario testing around and get a better understanding of how these pollutants are acting in the watershed. Is there an opportunity to do more with our models to address toxic contaminants and some of the other elements that we want in our healthy and restored Chesapeake Bay and watershed? So we will be part of this discussion. Um, it could be that in some ways, things like agricultural uh, pesticides might have some place in a future model that is able to look at BMP scenarios and tell us which ones are most protective. It's a possibility. There are no commitments made there, but that's the kind of thing that we're going to be uh, involved in, in this and making sure that people are thinking about. It's not just about nutrients and sediment. It's also about these other chemicals that we observe, some with very high frequency, including some of our agricultural herbicides that we normally detect year round throughout the bay. Um, so we're gonna be asking those questions and see if we can get some space in the phase seven watershed model. Now these next two, I wanna go into just a little bit more detail on. So uh, we'll go to the USGS endocrine disrupting compounds uh, uh, product that recently came out. So we can go to the next slide. Yep. And I want to really encourage everyone to take a look at this. Uh, we will drop this link and the link that we'll have on our next slide into, yeah, there we go. Bonnie, thank you very much. Um, and uh, really uh, encourage you to take a look. This was a, a fantastic set of data to begin with, but also the way that it's presented is novel and it's innovative and it's a great example of taking very complex scientific information and communicating it clearly. Um, when you go to this site, you will see the lead authors, Stephanie Gordon, Kelly Smalling, Vicki Blazer, and Scott Phillips of USGS. And it's just a fabulous piece of work. It really tells the story about toxic contaminants in Chesapeake Bay and its watershed very nicely, uh, but it gets into enough detail that you can tease out messages for specific classes of compounds. So you can see this one quote that we pulled um, 301 compounds that were analyzed in 370 different samples. And across those 27 different pesticides were detected. 
the uh, the impetus for this began in uh, 2002, I believe, if I have that right, and maybe somebody USGS can double check on that. It is on the website, but this really sprang from investigative work that was being done to follow up on fish kills that happened regularly in the North Branch of the Potomac and uh, also in the Shenandoah rivers. And that really was what began all of this meaningful work. Uh, Vicki Blazer, who we will hear from in our next session together, uh, did the groundbreaking work around these fish kills that indicated uh, reproductive impacts uh, on, in particular, smallmouth bass. And that has led to uh, just fabulous uh, monitoring and investigative work to see how are some of these contaminants uh, disrupting the endocrine systems of, in particularly fish, and uh, leading to population level effects and things like compromised reproductive success. Uh, so this, uh, what's called a geonarrative, yeah, a really interesting term. Uh, we've used the word storyboards in the past or story maps. Um, this is a geonarrative that presents a lot of this data and, and tells the story of these findings and it's current. Uh, this is another thing we try to do with our conference every year is bring some of the most recent and current data that we can put our hands on. And this certainly is a shining example of that. And uh, again, real hats off and kudos to the team at USGS that put together this geo narrative uh, in a way that uh, maybe all of us can find ways of using it to raise awareness and plan some of the work that we're doing in our, our agencies and home organizations. Okay, so that's the uh, story map from USGS on endocrine disrupting compounds. Another product that I want to point us to is a report from our Science and Technical Advisory Committee, STAC, at the Chesapeake Bay Program. Uh, we did a workshop and the resulting report you see the cover page for here. And it was around um, the science and, and approaches to informing how we manage contaminants of concern uh, from agricultural and urban settings, uh, particular focus on those two land uses uh, because they do present different profiles of toxic contaminants. And a couple of the conclusions on the left side of this slide, uh, we listed out some of the commonly applied agricultural chemicals and uh, pesticides that uh, the participants in this workshop offered data around. Um, it was mentioned that in urban areas, we still have some uh, bioaccumulation of organochlorine pesticides that trigger fish consumption advisories. Fortunately, it's quite limited at this point, but um, in addition to some of the current use ingredients that we would find in urban areas being used for things like insecticides, we still see a signal from the organochlorines that have been uh, out of production and use for well, several de decades now, since the 80s. Um, and so still seeing that signal. So that was a bit of the information that we've got uh, in this report about what we see as far as occurrence in ag and urban areas. And as you see in the title, this was also about, so what do we do about it? This got us over uh, to the management question. And in this report, we identified a couple of management practices that could be directly applicable to pesticides and pesticide loading. There is a iron amended sand filtration specifically uh, in some research has been shown to bind up pesticides and some wastewater pollutants and keep them from running off uh, in stormwater and into our surface waters. 
And then um, activative, activated carbon, active carbon uh, has been used in uh, some, some applications. In particular, we've had some uh, pretty sizable pilot scale op applications for PCB remediation. But the point here is that uh, carbon is going to be uh, sticky for any organic compound, uh, particularly those that are hydrophobic, and it can be a very good uh, medium to do some capture and improve, again, stormwater quality that improves our surface water quality. Uh, another link here for this report. And this report is helping us a lot with that conversation I mentioned about in the uh, phase seven watershed model or in some other way, how can we be smarter about the BMPs that will be helpful in retaining some of these toxic contaminants that we're so interested in and uh, use whatever information we have about BMPs to provide our stakeholders with better planning tools and ways to get at our results that we need for things like DO, while also making sure we're not loading in these contaminants to the greatest extent possible. So that is a run through a couple of high priority activities in the toxic contaminant work group um, and a couple of work products that really encourage you to take some time and have a look at. Okay. Well, Bonnie, do we have any questions come in about that? We do actually. And thank you, Greg. That was that was really some great work. We really appreciate you sharing that with us. We do have a couple questions. Um, one, do we know what happens when there's more than one pesticide in the water? Right. So we started talking about this with Nathan a little bit, and the answer is no, we, we really don't. Uh, and uh, as we, we spoke about before, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, the health effects criteria that agencies like EPA produce uh, tend to be single ingredient thresholds. What we don't know is what the right threshold is when there are multiple active ingredients and their degradants. Uh, I think next session, when we hear from Vicki Blazer at USGS, she's gonna be talking about this. She has been emphasizing this recently that uh, these active ingredients metabolize and they turn into different compounds, but some of those are expected to have um, residual toxicity. They're still, they're still of some risk. And so it's not only the active ingredients that we see, but where are the degradates? What are the degradates? Uh, are we looking for them? Do we have knowledge of them? And how do we deal with adding those to the risk profile? So uh, really difficult ongoing challenge. I was intrigued by what Nathan mentioned about some work in the EU along these lines. And maybe we can do some research to make sure that we can uh, be on, on top of that and see what's coming out of that work, but very difficult challenge. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea that we follow that. We've got one more question here. What can we do to keep pesticides out of the bay? Well, uh, we know that in the bay watershed, the place where the greatest investment is made is around nutrient and sediment reductions to get to those dissolved oxygen goals that we have. And so our best leverage, we still believe, is uh, aligning ourselves with that work and getting to those co-benefits, getting to uh, the, the information and the planning resources that will help us say, if we have a scenario that gets us to DO, scenario A, but scenario B also gets us to those dissolved oxygen goals, but it does a better job with capturing pollutants that might be uh, important to a given land use, let's go with option B. Uh, and let's get those scenarios of best management practices in place that provide the maximum co-benefit. Uh, 
it's it's not likely, it's not possible, it's not really conceivable that uh, we're going to quickly get to a place. And I think Nathan said this too, where we're not using, for uh, for example, um, uh, insecticides in our urban environments and herbicides in our agricultural environments. Uh, the social benefits are too great. The key is to keep them in the places where they're designed to do their job. Uh, and not have them running off in stormwater and through groundwater uh, into our surface waters and impacting bay resources. Uh, so uh, we're going to try to continue to uh, join up with the nutrient and sediment work instead of trying to reinvent something different. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, Greg. I think we're about out of time on questions and need to move on, but we really appreciate everything you brought to us. Um, can I see the next slide, please? So we do want to take a minute and go back to our wonderful sponsors, and we wanted to share just a little bit about them and their website links so you can discover how each one of these organizations and businesses are pioneers as truly green businesses in organic food, products, and land care management, in regenerative agriculture, in teaching restoration and stewardship, and by protecting our water and environment. So you can check out the links that I'll put in chat. And I'm also gonna post our goorganicnow.org website, which connects you to these and other organic resources. It's all about how we vote with our wallet, vote with our fork by going organic. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to convene again November 30th, and we have a really great program, including Dr. Kyla Bennett. Dr. Bennett works for Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, also known as PEER, and she's their Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Director and PEER's Director of Science Policy. And she'll be talking to us about how PFAS have been found in an alarming number of pesticides, including those sold over the counter in home improvement stores. And these toxic chemicals are not just contaminants from packaging, they are also put in pesticides as both inert and active ingredients. And this presentation will explore why PFAS are in pesticides and efforts to get them out. And we're also gonna hear from Dr. Vicki Blazer, who's a research scientist with U.S. Geological Survey's National Fish Health Laboratory. And Dr. Blazer is a trailblazer herself in studying the impacts of pesticides in fish. And she'll be sharing new findings about an area not routinely measured, the pesticide metabolites and impurities such as PFAS, which she's found to be in significantly high concentrations over long periods of time. Both of these presentations will highlight new emerging areas of concern. So please mark your calendar and plan to join us and we'll send you a reminder as it gets closer to the date. Next. Last and certainly not least, we want to acknowledge the generous funders who underpin our work. We're very grateful to these fine foundations for their support of the pesticides and the Chesapeake Bay Watershed Project and other NPEN programs. Next, thanks especially to you all for spending the time to learn with us. And a heartfelt thank you to our team behind the scenes, Greg and Ruth, of course, our technical team, Doug Miller, Emily Ranson, and Jack Solomon, and our Jamboard moderators, Ling Tan and Veronica Corella. We're gonna leave the webinar open for five or 10 minutes so you can continue to chat and add to the Jamboards. And you can look for an email tomorrow. We'll send you links to the video session and the chat, the Q&A transcript, 
and uh, also our participant list. So you guys can continue to network. That's really been a really important part of our conference is the connections that we make with one another and uh, the conversations that come out of that. And that kind of collaboration is, is what we really hope to continue through this virtual platform. So I guess we'll see you after Thanksgiving. I hope you have a great one and we'll see you back here on November 30th. So have a great day, everybody. And thanks for coming. Thanks for the participation, everyone. Thank you. See you on November 30th.